and the first part, the first two hours, going to be Samantha and I covering this um, topic of reproducible research. So if you click on the link, you end up on this page. I can briefly talk about the learning outcomes for this page. So the idea and what we will cover on these first two hours kind of builds up from the from where we started with the first week. Ideally, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to follow good practices, good enough practices to keep your directories and your projects well organized. It's important that you understand that code and software in general have basically dependencies that can be related to the system where you are or to other libraries and other piece of codes that, that are written by others. And so it's important to also document this. Then hopefully you will be able to document the computational steps and have an idea when this can be help, helpful and useful. And then we will briefly introduce you to the world of containers. We will just, you know, scratch the surface there. We will not go deeper into that, but it's uh, it's an important topic to, to basically consider. And Samantha, do you want to say something else here related to the learning outcomes or? No, but maybe let's talk a little bit about how it all connects in the next page. So for those of you that have joined already last week, you might be familiar with this um, wonderful little image here by Heidi Seibold. And this time it looks a little bit different um, in a sense that we have added all the code refinery lesson titles to this figure because the code refinery workshop itself can could also be called like a workshop on reproducible research, like everything that we do here, like leads to you being better prepared for um, doing reproducible research in with your code. And um, we have these six helpful steps here. And for example, the get your files and folders in order is already is will be covered today in the reproducible research session. Um, then we have the good file names um, for on folder names, which is covered in uh, tomorrow's lesson about documentation. And then on day six, modular code development, we talk a little bit about like um, how already naming can help you in starting your documentation, for example. Then in general, documenting code, uh, writing readmes, code comments, and how that can help you help others and you understand your code later better. Then we had the version control, basically whole last week, or not just basically, the whole last week was all about version control, introduction to version control, and then also collaborative distributed version control. If you have missed that, you can always go back and watch the videos um, to learn about that there. And uh, then this week, we talk basically on every day, something about destabilizing your computing environment and the software. We will start today um, with, for example, the containers idea, then Jupyter notebooks tomorrow, automated testing on day six, and also modular code development. We'll talk about how you can do this stabilization. And then in the end, you will probably want to uh, publish your research outputs, which means your code, your data, your documents, and um, topics related to that will be discussed today afternoon in the social coding and open software lesson. And that's basically how it all connects. And this two hours that we have now here on reproducible research are like a small glimpse into the world of the tools and the concepts uh, that can help you with making your research code more reproducible. So do you want to continue, Enrico, with the motivation well, for this lesson? We can go to the motivation. I like to what when when you were explaining this to me when we were we when we were discussing that one can look at this in the sense of time scales, that the Git version control are basically focusing on you know on your day-to-day -day work or the weekly time scale but then sometimes you don't need to control or you you don't need to version control anymore the daily changes you want to start versioning the whole project which might last for months 
And so what we will cover here is like moving away from the day-to-day -day time scale to the controlling at the project level, so at the months or year level, or it can even be bigger as you heard in week number one that we were time traveling through Git. Here we will do even more time traveling, meaning going back to very old versions of operating systems and um, and and things like that. So that you know the future, the future selves and the future other people who want to rework with what we did are able to to travel back in time. So it's good to start with some motivation. Let me briefly check. If there's anything on the HackMD that is worth mentioning. All right, that's nothing specific. So <clears throat> basically the motivation when it comes to this episode on reproducible research, one could even argue that the whole code refinery workshop should be called reproducible computational research workshop, because as as you just heard from what Samantha has, has described, everything is kind of connected together with the goal of having a project, in the specific case, a research project that is able to be run many times over and over, and with the goal that you know that the same output is is when when you have the same input and the same code, you are able to reobtain the same output. So in this funny cartoon here. This is uh, funny. I don't know if it's that funny because it's actually <laughs> a trouble. <laughs> Not funny at all thing for the for the doctoral doctor researcher who is in this situation. And maybe many of you, if you if you've been to this type of situation, please let us know in the collaborative notes. But here you see the senior professor saying, don't worry, you know, you don't have to start your code from scratch because maybe some postdoc has written all the pipeline for the lab, but the post talk most likely has left to another lab and the professor continues you can reuse the software that the previous person on the project wrote several years ago and then the doctor research is like are there instructions for how to use it i doubt it is the code commented mm, not likely uh, where are the files who knows but this is going to be painful isn't it ah, it's just a scratch so I don't know about you, Samantha, but at least I have experienced this in the very beginning of when I when I started with the research work. And of course, here the context, of course, is academic research, scientific research, but the same issue could also be applied in uh, companies. You wouldn't like to to deliver, you know, a tool, a software tool, where one day you are able to make it work, and another day it's just giving completely different, completely different results. So here's some more scary, funny, but not funny anecdotes in this box here. So for example, a group of researchers obtain great results and submit their work to AI profile journals. And then usually after six months, if not even more, depending on the field, the reviewers finally tell you what's wrong and they ask for tiny changes to the figures or another analysis. And then when, when the people start working, on the revisions, they sometimes realize they're not even able to regenerate the same figures of the submitted version of the paper. Or then maybe some data got lost, some code they used to work suddenly doesn't work anymore and no one can figure out which part of the system stopped working. Why aren't we able to rerun you know, the, the same code that we did before submitting this paper? And this, of course, slows everything. And in some cases, even you know, the manuscript actually stays there in the in the file drawer. As this have happened to you, Samantha, that to, in this kind of situation. Oh yes, especially when the when the reviewing process is very long, and you basically already forgot what you what you did like half a year, a year ago. And then you should fix just a tiny little thing that uh, the reviewer didn't like, or that you maybe noticed even after the submission and can be very painful, but it's a hard way of learning also. Mm. And you pointed out really well that it's something that you did, which is something that also came out in the first week that the main collaborator that you have is yourself. So, and specifically yourself in the future. So you know that if you document well the 
software pipeline. If you really write down today how you created that figure in six months or in one year, your future self most likely will be very happy that you wrote down these notes, that you made your, your research reproducible, because this is what we're talking about here. And so that you know you will not have to restart from scratch like in this uh, like in this cartoon here. So most likely you heard about reproducible research. And again, I highly encourage to use our notes, share notes document where you can write your experiences on reproducibility in research. And even if you there's many nice talks and papers. So if, if you have the favorite talk or a favorite paper on the topic, please link it in the collaborative notes. But in general, kind of this so-called reproducibility crisis started maybe sometimes in the 2010. It kind of started in the field of experimental psychology where they clearly noticed that biases, which can be intentional biases or unconscious biases in the research project process, they were making the, the findings highly, highly, how can I say, variable they're basically irreproducible. So then what you see here in this figure without going deeply into the details is, um, is from a um, survey that the Nature Journal did in 2016. And so here the, they asked to various scientists in various fields how they felt, you know, if, if they feel that they, had, that they were struggling in reproducing an experiment, could be their own experiment, could be some experiment that you read from a, from a study that you try to reproduce locally. And the sentiment in general across all fields is that, you know, more than half of the, of the, of the respondents, they were saying that, yes, there is a crisis. It's impossible to reproduce the top papers in my field. I'm struggling to reproduce what I did six months ago and so on. So these levels of reproducibility, this is something that is important to understand because often in science, what we see is just the tip of this pyramid. What we see sometimes is just the article. And within the article, there might be a description of methods and they might be mentioning, although it's very rare if they use certain libraries or certain software tools, but often the kind of these methodological details down to the to the kind of to the code or to the computation they're kind of left to the to the reader as a, as a as an exercise, and unfortunately that's what makes it really difficult. That sometimes just by reading an article, it's just impossible to replicate what this what these people did. So hopefully an article comes with some documentation, meaning that you know the method section in the article sometimes needs to be expanded so that it can start adding details on which methods were used, what type of computational, I don't know, solutions were adopted and maybe a description, you know, if they are not able to share the data, they could at least describe how they collected the data, how they measured the phenomena. But you can already understand that sometimes without code and without data, it's still impossible to to reproduce the article that you're reading. Some articles, it's a minority, but it's getting more and more popular. They actually come with code and with the data. In general, recently in the publication process, many journals are asking for this data availability statement and code software availability statement, exactly for this reason, because if there is a chance that the data can be reused and if it's possible, to you know, look at the code that was used for the for the paper. This gives a great you know chances that the whole um, that the main results from the article are actually reproducible because running the same data with the same code should hopefully produce the same results. In practice, however, it's not as simple as that because code on its own tends to depend on multiple libraries multiple versions of softwares that one might be using. And then we have this layer of the environment. So with the environment here, we don't mean our nature and nurture, but we mean kind of the computational environment where the code is running, where the data are stored, so that if one could truly reproduce the same computational environment, bring the same code and the same data, most likely, if not very often, you are able to obtain the same, the same results. 
So this kind of gives a context of the reproducibility and why it's really important in research. We have a little bit of um, discussion item for our collaborative document. And so... Yeah, it is already there and people okay. are already answering. So you can oh, show excellent. it a little bit. Yeah, maybe I switch to... So what are your experiences rerunning or adjusting a script or a figure you created a few months ago? I really like the, the, the figure because I don't know about you, Samantha, but for me, at the beginning at least, like I was kind of, I'm not saying that I was editing my figures with Photoshop, but but for example, the arrows, they look so, I didn't like the arrows of whatever program I was using in those days. And so I was always manually fixing some arrows or the fonts in the arrows. Have you, have you ever done that? Have you, have you committed this? <laughs> this crime, yes. <laughs> I've also done that, like, because also when you don't, when you're new to like using things like matplotlib in Python or something like this, and you don't quite easily know how to do it, but like in some other software, it is really just a few clicks to add an arrow to show, to highlight something. Um, well, it's a natural step to go. Mm -hmm. And, but then uh, uh, it will come to haunt you at some point, very likely. Yeah, I mean, it. it... There's not even anything wrong per se with, you know, it, 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 the issue is that often people don't write down that, you know, after I generated the figure with Mapper Plate, I open it with Inkscape and I change all the fonts to whatever fancy font I wanted to use. If people would already document this, then there would already be a one layer of reproducibility added in this process of the figure. But of course, in general, I mean, it's, it's clear that if one could create the figure all with the script, then you, you you don't need to write down whatever manual steps you need to do with Photoshop or, or Inkscape. And it's super easy to forget those steps, these mm. manual steps afterwards, because running the script is easy, but then opening it again in another software is like one more thing to think about always. That's in general a big issue with these graphical user interface tools that of course you can document all the clicks and buttons that you need to do for reobtaining the same the same output, the same outcome. But sometimes it's difficult, and then the interface changes, and suddenly you can't. The buttons are not there where they used to be, and and you can't do that anymore. So here, people are still writing. Have you continued working from a previous students? I guess yeah. This at least I found it quite common, not just in my experience, but with the people that I help in my in my daily work. Uh, it's nice that someone is talking about pre-registrations and register report. I'm one of the strong strong supporter of this um, of this way of, of doing science. But maybe the clock is ticking and it's 1021 in Finland. So if there's nothing else specifically to be mentioning here, we could continue with the next. So organizing your projects. Mm, basically, this is something that everyone came across that you start your, it can be your doctoral studies, master thesis, or it can even be that you just joined a new company and you're working on some software, it all starts with the project organization. And so, of course, complex projects might have very complex structures and dependencies and multiple locations with data and code. But most likely, you are you're starting with your own project where you are the project manager and, um, and the main responsible on the organization of the project. There's, of course, hundreds of ways of storing data and organizing your file system. But here in this uh, in this page, we try to kind of give you the 
basics that are useful for organizing your, your project. So what you see here, this is like a so-called tree view of a file system where you would have a folder called project name. And then inside that folder, there are some subfolders, data, process data, manuscript, result, and this SRC, which is like source, source for the code and doc for the documentation. So of course, this is not the only way to structure a project, but you understand that, let's say that you win the lottery and you then decide to stop doing research work and you move to a nice island in the Pacific Ocean and live there happily. At least the next person who will need to, you know, resume your project kind of gets a clear idea if if already sees the same structure that we see here, it's a structure that is familiar to the new person. And then most likely, you know, there are some notes written on this readme document that would explain what's in different folders and what is the status of things. And then it's easier for, for your collaborator basically to continue where the project was left. Very different from the situation that we saw in that PhD comic where the, where the poor doctoral researcher had no idea about even where the files were, were stored. So in general, this tracking that we've been covering in the first week, the tracking of the changes of the code, it starts to now scale in this time scale that we said earlier, it's now becoming also tracking of the data, tracking of the results that uh, you, know, you might be producing. And so, and so basically, I mean, this all fits into the kind of into what we were mentioning earlier that it's not just about the tiny changes, documenting the tiny changes in with the Git version control, tiny changes to the code, but also depending on the on the project, you might also need to version control the data, and there are tools for that, or version control the results because you would have more iterations of the same figure. And then in the end, you want to keep whatever is the final version of the figure and so on. So when it comes to tools and templates, but maybe be before talking about tools and templates, we could also ask these couple of questions to the people who are watching us. So yep, how do you they're collaborate? They're already being answered. Okay, that's excellent. You are so efficient this morning, everyone. And so the first question that we wrote in the collaborative notes is, are you using virtual control for academic papers? And this is, of course, very interesting because now it's not about tracking the changes in the code. One is actually about tracking, you know, about changes in, um, in the manuscript. And then the second question is, how do you handle collaborative issues? For example, conflicting changes. Maybe before switching to the um, collaborative notes, I'm going to ask Samantha, are you using or have you been using some sort of version control for academic papers in your with your supervisor or? Yeah, like many others also already wrote here, we are currently using mainly Overleaf for collaboration on academic papers. It's nice because it has the integration with git and you can look back in history and all these kind of things and how we are fixing these collaborative issues there like conflicting changes is that uh, well everyone sees at all times like what the others are already working on so there is um, never that situation that some change comes out of nowhere but then we also try to first comment, like, I would like to add this here. And then we all say, OK, and then we let that person work on on a section, for example. How about you? Yeah, yeah I mean, I've been working with seniors um, in my in my in my previous research. I was doing lots of basically neuroscience and some of the seniors I've been working with that might not be at the level of technology that they could use, you know, Git virtual control or a system like Overleaf. However, even tools like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, they also have embedded so-called version tracking or version control. So even with graphical tools like Microsoft Word, you know, it's not the best tool for, for, for doing version control, but it's still possible to, 
travel back in time, see what has changed in the document and comment on each other and then work with this type of conflicting changes. But it's nice that people here are writing their experiences. And also maybe this is a trend that I've noticed still with the new generation of younger PIs and supervisors that they're more moving towards this type of overleaf or you know distributed documents, distributed tools for, for collaborative writing. Um, so we still have a few minutes and there are some very nice links here that Samantha added to this page. This is something nice that came out last week because last week we uh, talked about um, how you can have a repository that is a template so that by cloning the or forking the, the template, you can basically work on the folder structure or existing structure from the template. And so here there's a nice collection of, of templates that by basically by forking them or by creating a new repository from the template, you are able to get a folder structure that is similar to the one here. So this is good practice that if you're starting a new project, you can actually immediately start, start it as a repository, as a Git, Git repository. And for example, we can have briefly a look at the Turing Way template where you see this type of similar structure. There's more subfolders, but you know, does really matter. It, we clearly see that it's a, it's a similar to the structure that we were proposing. Uh, more recently, there's also this type of reproducible publications. And so Overleaf, the tool that Samantha already mentioned is an important one, but it's not the only one. And in general, this is also something that journals are kind of catching up, trying to also publish something that is a little bit more dynamic in a sense that now there are publishing platforms that allow basically to run the code while you are reading the while you're reading the manuscript and so for example Jupyter is now able to to be in some publication platform they're using it I can mention a couple in the neuroscience at least in the notes document however it's 1029 which is exactly one minute before our plan schedule. So Samantha, what are we going to do next? We actually had five minutes more for the collaborative document, but oh. I think we looked at it already and there's at least no new questions that need to be answered. They have already some answer here. So I think we can go on and then um, after the next section, we will have a little bit longer break also to collect our thoughts. So yep. I will take the screen share from you. Built in display. Yes, just move the Zoom stuff out of the way and show you the next section. So please um, continue answering in our collaborative documents, the question that we already have there. It's always a nice collection to look through also after the workshop of uh, what kind of experiences have different people made and how they solved it. Um, our next section will be about recording computational steps. So um, we probably all have been in that situation that we have some steps that we need to do in order to do our works. Like Enrico mentioned before, the uh, plotting can be one of these steps. Before that, we probably need to process our data in some way that already makes two steps. And um, there is probably many different ways of how we can record these kind of um, steps that we need to run um, one after another and in which order and how they are connected. And um, one way of doing this are um, workflow tools. And that is what this next section will be about. Um, and that is one way of how these steps can be recorded also in a reproducible manner. And um, for that section, just find my mouse. We will take a look at an example project that we have in our code refinery space. It's called WordCount. Um, you can see here it has 
like a light, lightweight structure that Enrico discussed before here. Also, we have some code data, some other folders, and then some more files, and we'll look into those a little bit more in a bit. So first, this uh, repository provides us with some code that um, takes in some data, and the data is also part of the repository, which are book texts. And then it provides us with uh, some code. Um, maybe we can take a brief look here. So in the data section, we have um, four texts that contain like the text of a book. And then when we go into the code section, we have two scripts. Those are small Python scripts and no worries if you don't use Python in your work. You don't have to like understand what's happening here. Basically, the name already tells um, a little bit about this story. So we have a count um, script, which counts the number of times each word appears in uh, a file. And in this case, we want to know how many times each word appears in each of these books. Um, and that gives us then the word and the count. And then the second step in this workflow that we'll be working with today is uh, plotting this frequency of the 10 most used words in these books. So a pretty simple like workflow. First, we analyze the data, then we plot the data. And there can be many more, of course, but this now just simplified to look at it. Um, there is also mentioned in this readme here that there is dependencies, and this is something that we will look at a little bit later in this lesson. So for now, we can maybe ignore it because I will demo this now here. If you want to run this on your own computer later, then you can have a look at this environment file and see what to do with it. And you will learn that in the, the later lesson. And so in our case, we have kind of a given structure of how we run these things, because we first have to count the words and store that somehow. And then we need to use that data to, to plot um, the frequency of each word. And one way of how we can do that, and which is maybe what the first thing that comes to our mind is to um, just run one Python code after another with the inputs and the outputs. So let's do that. Um, I will move this aside. The link to this um, repository is in the collaborative document. So you can follow there. I hope you now see my, yes, you see my um, command line. So I have um, my terminal here. I've cleaned it up a little bit. And then I also have down here, um, for example, what if I type something here, you can see the command I typed in the bottom, just so that you can follow along a little bit better. So let's now first um, do what we what we learned last week. First, we get the code to our our computer by using git clone. I'll get the link from outside of your screen. Sorry, git clone, paste the link. OK, and then we go into the word count directory. OK, so now we can take a look that all this information is really here. We have the code, the data directories. We have some other files. Everything is here. So if we now want to um, run, for example, our Python code on, on one book, we can copy the line for the Python code from the readme file, which was something like this here. So we call Python, we call the script that we have. We want to run it on the book called IELTS.txt. And we want to store that those results in the statistics alts.data. OK, that didn't take long. Um, and now we can, for example, look with any kind of tool 
what we have in statistics as the data. So there we now see the is 3,822 times in that book, then the next one is off and so on. And this will probably look quite similar for the different books, but we still want to get these names. So what we can do now is um, we can also plot the whole thing in a similar way. Uh, luckily, the README already provided us with the, these code lines. So we can copy them from there. Here, it looks a little bit different. So we, we call Python on the plot.py script. We have uh, an input data file, which is our statistics IELTS.data, and then a plot file where we want to store the plot. So we can run that as well. Yep. And then we can take a look with this program, for example, to show the plot. And let me just check that you can see this. Yes. Um, so this is one of the plots, what we want to have. And in our case, we now have four books. So it seems easy enough that we just run these Python scripts one after another um, for these different books. And then we could make ourselves a note. OK, we ran Python script one, two, three, or we can even write them down. We could even collect them in uh, um, a bash script or some other kind of script. It could be a Python script or something else where we just record like running one script after another. And we also have that actually in this um, in this repository, it's called runall.sh. So there you can see now we have multiple rows of the same stuff. So we have Python code count pi, and then one book after another we run through. And then the same for the plot lines, we plot one after another. So that would be one way of like recording these computational steps. Um, one uh, shorter way, because you maybe are, are looking at this and you're seeing, okay, we could also do this a little bit shorter. Yes, we can. We can, for example, um, loop through the different files that we have in our data directory and then apply each, um, each script on each book file. Uh, automatically, so that would then look something like this, a little bit shorter. Don't worry about the bash. We just have here a for loop, and we loop through all these four books, and then we apply these count.py and then plot.py on, on our files. So Enrico, would you say this is now more reproducible? Are we there? Can we well, stop I mean, here? I mean, already this is quite an advanced project in a sense that I can see from what you've been describing that we're trying to remove the human from the from running the script, from the interaction with the data. Because often when I inherit some code from some project and even me myself, I'm responsible of that. I'm in, instead of having a generic plot.py, I've, I've been having plot underscore book one dot py. And there inside, I would have hard coded the name of book one. And then it would be silly that I need to create many plot underscore book two, plot underscore book three. So this project is already excellent that this plot and count, they're like functions, modular, that then depending on the input, they can be, they can be rerun. But the issue that maybe I would criticize on the reproducibility. What if the books would be 1000? That, you know, sometimes these four loops with this bash terminal scripting, you know, maybe something dies with one of these 1000 books. Is there a better way for, you know, scaling kind of in a more reproducible way? Yeah, good that you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we also have a better way. Um, or a way that helps with some of the issues that you have mentioned here. And um, so now we are going from basically saying, um, do this and then that. So in this case, we said first, okay, first count the, the 
uh, the words, how, how often they occur in the text, and then plot it. Um, we describe the dependencies between those plots because here we can see that um, the second one requires the first one to be run because we need the output of the first um, of the first script to be produced before we can even run the plot.py file. And um, workflow tools are one set of tools that can help with that so that you don't have to like worry to make clear run this and then that, but you state, okay, the second or this uh, plot requires count to be run. So the workflow tool figures out how it can do that and how it can connect these different steps that you have um, in your workflow. And one example workflow tool that we will be looking at today uh, is SnakeMake. It's um, one of many tools uh, to create this kind of reproducible and scale scalable data analyst analysis workflows. And um, in the case of SnakeMake, we can already take a peek here in the repository. We scroll up. There's something called a snake file ready for us. Um, so it describes the workflow in a human readable um, way, but that also the machine can deal with. And this is a Python based language, but uh, you can run all kinds of script with this. So in our example, we run a Python script, but you can run also R scripts or any other language that you might be working with. And one nice thing about these SnakeMake workflows is that they can scale rather seamlessly from your own laptop to a high performance computing cluster or the cloud uh, without the need to modify this uh, SnakeMake um, file. While when you are running some other kind of script, you might have to modify things there to be able to run it like in a different environment. Um, there was one question in the collaborative document, what's a script? And the answer is pretty good. Like, uh, um, so we collect all the, all the commands that we want to run into, into one file and have a series of instructions there, similar to like a cooking recipe, for example, where it's, uh, described like what you need to do and, um, step by step. Okay, then uh, the snake make file. So you can see it here. Maybe I make it a little bit bigger still. Um, so we can find already some some things that we have seen before. Um, for example, we are uh, we have our our Python scripts mentioned here. Uh, the counted pi, the plot.py. We have our data files mentioned here. And the way this is set up, so this is already set up for us for the workflow that we just showed. And the first thing here is that we define uh, variable data with a snake make specific function that finds us all the book titles in our data directory that end with the extension text. And then we only want the title of that book in this data variable. Then we have a, a so-called rule-based system here. So um, in general, every rule within SnakeMake has an input, which is um, according to like what we also There's were calling in. There's some questions yes. about what is Snake make like didn't understand that and reasons for computational steps. So, could you? Sorry. Um, oh, why? It's like the last two questions. Ah, oh, what snake make is used for? Um, so it's for recording the computational steps in a different manner, and maybe this becomes clear now when we go through it a little bit better. Um. And what is the main reason for 
recording computational steps so that we can reproduce um, our computational workflow also later. So if we would now just run, um, let me just show this again, if we, or if we would just run our one Python script after another, um, then we would maybe forget like what did we actually run and in what order did we run those. So we try to write it down somewhere and one way is to put those calls into a, a script that we then store, um, for example, alongside our data or in our repository. I hope that answers, but at least the snake make what it's used for, I hope that will become clear during this section. If not, please um, move the question to the bottom again and we'll try to explain it in more detail. Um, so the snake file contains of um, rules and every rule as a minimum needs an input or every rule uh, has an input, an output and a shell command, every normal rule. Um, so we define what um, kind of things does this rule need to run. And in this case, we need this Python script and then we need the book file defined. So and now yeah. there's some questions like snake make versus a script that runs stuff in a loop. Um, we will also get back to that a little bit okay. after this demo. Okay, yeah, so we'll see, good. What are the differences? And um, it might also be like, this is one example of a workflow tool and it might help you in some ways, but it's not the solution to everything. Like if you only have a few steps in your workflow and little input files and are very sure that you will never have to like run it on many, many more files, for example, then probably SnakeMake or any other workflow tool is overkill and like you can just run it by using a script instead of uh, like kind of adding this another layer of complexity that you do with the workflow tool. Um, okay, I'll get back to the other questions afterwards, but yeah, please keep them coming. So we have our rule that we call count words, uh, where we have our Python script for counting, our input file, we define what is the output file. In this case, it's collected in the statistics folder um, with the same name as the input file and the data extension. And then here we define this very same call that we also had in our script before. And we use these um, wildcards for that. So um, we don't need to write out this here, but it can it will be filled in when Snake Make is running automatically. And then we have a second rule here for making a plot, which uh, takes in also the script again, a book. This time it is the output of the previous script here. And this is the important part for Snake Make to figure out how to run these scripts and how to deal with the data that you give it. Um, and then we have output file, which is the plot. And again, the Python call in this case. And here you can see that it's not like Python specific, but you could have any other, any other shell commands here. Okay, and then we have this overarching rule here called all, which is basically a that collects everything that um, that is to be done in this workflow. So it waits for inputs to be there that are this statistics.data file, uh, this book.data file, and the the plot um, figure. Okay, let's get back to that in a moment. Let's first maybe 
um, run this once. So snake make can be run with the command snake make. And then we have to give it how many cores to use for this run. And um, then right now, because I have already processed one of the files manually, we first delete all output. And I have forgotten um, that I need to go into my Conda environment and Enrico will tell you what that is um, after the break. So I have to first Conda activate code refinery environment to make my snake make available. So now I can run the delete all output command. It tells me something about building DAG of jobs. We'll get to that in a moment. And then it deletes all um, the outputs of previous runs that are also part of the repository. So we want to now see what SnakeMake does when we run it. So um, we have this snake file in the base repository so we can run SnakeMake like this. And then it tells us a lot of things. And for some reason, this is not updating. I'm sorry for that. I hope it's slow enough to follow along if you want to do that later. So I'm scrolling up to what SnakeMake actually told me. So here it's again this building this DAG of jobs, and that is how SnakeMake figures things out how to run. So it will first go and look at the all rule. What are the expected inputs for this very last rule? And then it will go further up or look at the other rules. Where do these files actually come from? Where is this plot produced? And then it will run, try to run that rule. And then it will notice that, okay, for creating the plot, we actually need the data first. So we need to have counted the frequencies of the word first. So then it will find the rule where that is the output and run that. And it summarizes this all here. So we have the name of the rules. All uh, it found out that it needs to run it once to collect all the outputs. Then we have the count word um, count word rule that it figured out because there is four books it needs to run it four times and the same for the make make plot and then it tells us why it ran each stop each step that it ran so it figured out um, statistics IELTS data is not not existing at the moment so it finds out what it needs to run to uh, bring it into existence. And that is then um, step one out of nine. And then it checks further what to what to execute and goes on and on. And one thing to note here is that there is different job IDs that um, that are not necessarily in order. So it will figure out that for each book, it first needs to run the statistics um, file and then the plot file. Um, but it does not necessarily run first the statistics file and then the plot file for each book, but it may mix it up a little bit so that it runs first two books, the statistics file, and then one of these plots, and then another of the statistics and another one of these plots. And that it also, it all gets to know through this snake file. And now I see that I'm already very short on time, basically already over. So I will check what I wanted to show here still. So we could now go and check that all the all the files are there. Maybe for right now, you can trust me that it created all the plots and all the statistics files. And now the, the power of SnakeMake comes really from this, that if we now had a script that would run all these steps, 
and we now added um, a new a new file. For example, let's let's do this briefly. There, there's a question. The last one. Yeah. Maybe useful to go now. I don't understand this code. How come it runs for multiple books? The files only run once. Oh. Um, which code is maybe like yeah, maybe in the, the snake file? I, I assume maybe it was talking about the snake file or something like how does the snake file run for all the separate codes? Okay, this is um, figured out in the snake file by using these wild cards. So in uh, this cat in this step here, it figures out what all um, text files are available in this data directory. So it knows that there is four right now. And in the command line, it showed us like for each of the books um, that it ran it, like for Sierra was one book, uh, last something was some book. So we can see that it actually ran it for, for all the files. Um, so if we now, this, this same thing we can do with a script, but if we now have a new data file, for example, this, don't worry about the editor, this is now just an editor and there is some text in here. There's some text in here, which I would, like my script to count and plot. And I save that. In the script case, I now would need to run my script again, or I would run need to run the steps separately again. In the snake make case, if I now run snake make again, you can could maybe see it was very fast that it's it now was a little bit faster. And we can see in the job statistics here that it figured out that it only need to run one, one file. And that is, I can find it here probably. Yeah, the new.txt. So it found there's one new file that it has not processed all the way. Um, so it processed only the new file. And the same thing happens also if there would now be, for example, a change in one of the scripts. Let's say in the plot script, we don't want to plot the script, uh, the bars in blue, but want to put them in red, for example. So we would go into the script and change it. Um, if we then tell SnakeMake to run again, it will figure out which files are affected by this change. So it will figure out that it will not have to run all the statistics again, but only the plotting. And that is unfortunately the time over for this topic. Yeah, um, if you're interested in this, uh, I would highly recommend to go on the um, lesson page. There is also the example and um, some discussions around it and all the steps that uh, I had planned to do now and that I didn't get through are mentioned also here and also some more explanations of each of the rules and then also take a look at the solution, um, how to do it. You can also visualize this workflow, uh, this DAG, uh, directed acyclic graph, what SnakeMake is using in the background. Um, and we are using SnakeMake here because compared to many other workflow tools, it has a rather gentle learning curve. I understand that this was probably a little bit confusing. Sorry for that. Um, but if you take a look and try to apply it yourself, um, I think you will better understand how things are how things are connected and how um, why this could be like a benefit for you, also your workflow. You can use it on many different platforms. Uh, SnakeMake is also very smart in a way that it can figure out 
um, if there is independent steps that it can run those in parallel. Um, and you can also run it with the next two topics of this lesson, the isolated environments and also containers. Uh, it's very much used in bioinformatics, but um, as you can see, like we can use it for counting words as well. So it's not specific to bioinformatics. So you can run all kinds of workflows with it. And they have a super extensive documentation with lots of videos and lots of tutorials going on. And there is lots of similar tools that you can also find here that you can use for that. So we can um, collect these computational steps in many, many ways and workflow tools may be able to help with doing this. And I will still go through the questions and look at it, but I think now we should take a break, right? Yes, thanks, Samantha. I think now we can have a break, 10 minutes break, so we can be back on the stream at 11, uh, what is that? Finish time, 11.14. Yeah. And I can write this in the collaborative notes. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Hello, and welcome back. So hopefully you're all still well motivated to make your work more reproducible. Oh. So it's really nice that there's many questions on this um, topic that we've been um, covering so far. And compared to previous runs of the code refinery workshop, I think this is great that we decided to focus more on giving you demos and showing you the tools because then the questions are actually more, you know, at the general level that um, rather than trying to, you know, rerun the same scripts that Samantha was running, for example and focusing on specific errors that are not related to this uh, topic. And in general, we will have time to answer all these questions with more details during the longer break. And all the answers, of course, will be archived. So hopefully this is a great resource for your, for your future learning goals. All right, so we kind of if we go back to these time scales of tracking changes and making things that you can rerun what you did six months ago or a year ago, after tracking the tiny changes with the version control from week one, then we look at kind of recording the steps because in some cases, maybe, you know, there's just a single script that you need to run. There's just a single data file that you need to load. And maybe that is the single step of your of your research, but in many cases, one needs to, like we saw with the books, run through 1,000 books or 1,000 parameters, hyperparameters, 1,000 whatever training input files in machine learning. So then the kind of the, the computational steps and all the steps that one needs to record, they start to scale up, that it starts to become you know, impossible to manually remember that you still need to run whatever permutation, 1,555. But then in general, if we keep on increasing the time scale, so what we're trying to document and what we're trying to record, then we go at the time scale of the system of the project. So in this funny XKCD figure here, this is not just about actually scientific research. This is in practice when it comes about any modern digital infrastructure it can be popular social media that you use or I don't know, your email service provider. So people, companies and scientists and researchers, they build on top of other people's work. And sometimes, you know, there might be a tiny little element that is literally keeping all the infrastructure together. And when it comes to scientific research and scientific code, of course, you want to document if you truly depend on that little, you know, project that some random person in Nebraska has been maintaining since 2003. In the internet, actually, there's one tool very useful in the internet, which is called curl. 
And for many years, the curl command has been basically maintained by a single person for free, even though it's it's one of those core elements that is inside any software that uses the internet, basically. So continue with kind of the kitchen analogy, because we always like to talk about cooking. <laughs> So um, this also came up in the collaborative, collaborative notes that if the software, if the code is like the recipe, so they're like the steps that you need to run to cook whatever you're planning to cook. And if the data are like the ingredients that you need to mix together to obtain what you want to cook, then we have the so-called libraries or modules or whatever you want to call them, that they're like the cooking books because most likely you don't want to write your own cooking book. You don't want to write your recipe. You want to reuse an existing recipe. And um, libraries, maybe many of you are familiar with the Python programming language. Most likely you're using libraries like NumPy or Pandas or Matplotlib so that you don't need to write in pure Python, you know, how to take care of big matrices or how to work with the uh, uh, tabular data, but you can easily reuse existing libraries so that you can focus on the actual, you know, enjoyment of the final cook cooked product rather than, you know, focusing or rewriting something that already exists. So with this specific page here, with this specific lesson, we're trying to understand that there needs to be a way when we want to document all our process all our steps there also needs to be a way to document how we depend on on other libraries because maybe today there's a certain version of numpy and it might be that in one year or in five years from now that version will have drastic changes to the current version that is right now and then your code will not be able to run anymore because it was depending on these external libraries so to understand this in a more practical way. And here I'm asking the help of Samantha <laughs> to do this exercise together. So let's let's consider this uh, so-called we wrote here time capsule of, of dependencies. So there could be that, all right, you inherit some code from the previous postdoc of the research lab that you're joining. And all you see in the code that there's a couple of imports of some libraries. So that's it. You don't really know which libraries the codes need, but you just see maybe like in the Python case, it would be you see some import NumPy. Then you have another, a little better case maybe, or is it better, where with the code, there's also a readme file, which basically writes down, you know, you really need NumPy for this, uh, for this project. But it doesn't mention which NumPy do I need, the NumPy from 2011. Did it even exist or you know a numpy from 2024 then you might find you might be more lucky and with the project that you inherit you might find that there's also some sort of a structure file this specific file format is this is just a text file but it's called yml yet another markup language and the yaml file is, is just a way to basically write in a in a way that is machine readable something that also a human can understand and this specific case we don't need i'm not going to tell you right now what this means but at least you see that here we explicitly say that we have our code depends on having numpy and and scipy and sumpy and other python python projects and here, interesting, actually, they even have references to some um, Git projects. So in, in this case, Samantha, would this mean that this dependency file is also referring to a specific branch in a specific project, isn't it? Yeah, to the master branch in the GitHub repository of some user called some project. OK, so then if I inherit this file with all the other files of the project, then I would know that I also need to figure out how to basically git clone this branch from this project and make sure that it's visible with the rest of the libraries. But we have more cases in this challenge. 
in this case, this is a similar file than the one before, but I see some differences. There's more added numbers. So Samantha, do you think, or at least I guess that these other numbers is more like trying to fix the version. What I was saying earlier that maybe one really needs to have a version 1.16, but what about this, this thing that you see at the end of the Git URL? Yeah, because if you don't have the versions, then you usually get like the latest possible, the latest that is available. And that of course might change between years or even already weeks. And then for Git, now we are not like referring to a branch anymore, but we are referring to a specific commit. And we have learned about commits and also tags last week. Um, so it's way more specific than referring to, especially the master branch, which also is something like the tool might have developed over time. So the master branch might not be the same as it was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, but the commit stays. Exactly. The so, that, so that basically here we are literally traveling to the exact time point where the project, some project, you know, had a specific tag or specific specific time point. And then the last case, if you if you see what I see, that now this some project and this um, another project now they have their own version. So most likely here, the um, person who are working, working with this project, they also made a, a, a release and they gave it a tag name that is in this case, the number of the release so that it can be you know made more clear in this, in this dependency. So now we have these five scenarios and in your opinion, Samantha, which version do you expect would be the easiest to rerun and why? We'll choose uh, version E because um, like there you have actually all packages. So also the things that were in the version D and the previous one um, were on GitHub only and linked to there um, and linking to some cryptic uh, commit hash or something out now have versions. So they have been packaged. So it's like a much nicer way of referring to them. But already D is very good. I think in terms of reproducibility, because you have the version. So even if you run this one year from now, that old version will hopefully still be available somewhere so you can still use it. Whereas mm -hmm. when you don't specify the version um, and rely on the latest, latest and greatest, and that might be have more features or have um, like good stuff coming with it as well but uh, it might also have um, deprecated. So some functionality just doesn't exist anymore or has been replaced with a different function call or something like this. So there can be issues coming from that as well. How about you? Yeah, yeah I mean, I kind of naively thought that the C would be the way to go because I get the latest of whatever, the latest NumPy, the latest Python and the latest, you know, but if I, and I've been working with this type of, you know, get the latest of everything, but then suddenly things don't work when you get the latest of everything, then you need to go and track in this, some project that actually they clearly specify it stopped working after NumPy went to whatever version. So long story short, what we are trying to motivate you here and I can tell you this is so important if, if there's one of the things you need to remember from today. And if you wanna learn one thing from today, learn this. This is absolutely one of the most asked questions that we get in our support work at Alto and in anywhere. And it's the versioning of the dependencies. So there's one tool, there's various tools for doing that. And some tools are specific of some programming language. Here, for the purpose of focusing on a single one, we will talk about Conda. And so Conda is this type of tool that um, can be used with Python, but not only with Python, Conda can also be used with um, R, for example. It's one tool that is able to track these type of dependencies. So what you saw here in this YAML file, these are actually uh, machine readable files so that the Conda program is able to read these and, for example, create 
a so-called conda environment with the specific version. Now, what maybe some people struggle at the beginning to understand what are conda environments or Python virtual environments. I usually give this example that in one operating system, you might have one installation of Python and that has a specific Python version and it has some library with it. By adding more environments, it's like that you're reinstalling Python. You are installing a new version of Python with other set of libraries. And with this type of virtual environments, you can have multiple versions of Python, for example, installed in your computer. And it's actually a great thing. One could argue that, is it that I'm wasting disk space? Sure, maybe, you know, you are wasting some disk space, but we're still talking about small files, small library the price of wasting some disk space and having multiple versions of Python installed in your system is that actually you can have for different projects their own specific Conda environment, their own specific Python installation. And so you're sure that, you know, for that project, you can work with a specific Python version. Here we see 3.10 and some specific, you know, NumPy or whatever libraries you need to use. And the second advantage of using virtual environment is also, of course, the portability, because I might now start a new project today with this type of dependency. I don't really need to fix NumPy and Pandas because I'm happy with whatever I'm starting today, the new project, so just give me the latest. But then, you know, I might want to move this project to another system, or I might want to share this project with, um, with a colleague. And so it's possible to so-called freeze the environment, meaning that with, with some commands after kind of activating the environment or like after going inside this other installation of Python, then I can also tell, ask the program, you know, give me all the libraries that have been installed so far. So how oh, are we doing with the timings, I guess? Do we have time that I will give a quick demo of this or? Go ahead, a quick one. Okay, so let me get the right windows. So in this white window, you see where I'm gonna type and in the bottom window, you see the comments that I've been typing. So here I have this file that you saw there, mym.yaml. And now what I'm able to do is that with the command that you see here, I'm able to actually create this environment. Specifically now, instead of typing the same command that you see there, conda env create, so start a new environment, I will actually use a program called Mamba and we list it there. It's basically like conda, but it's a, again, one of those tools that you should learn about. It's a reverse it's a conda that is being rewritten in C so that it's much faster than the conda. Otherwise, I timed it yesterday. It would take 20 minutes for conda to, to resolve this environment. With Mamba, it takes maybe less than a minute. So Mamba env create, and then I specify this file. So now what happens is that um, it's basically first, seeing what type of request, what type of libraries I'm requesting. But of course you understand that even though I'm requesting only Python and NumPy, Pandas and Seaborn, so very basic stuff, these tools themselves, they might depend on other, many other libraries because I don't know, Seaborn needs to depend on Matplotlib plus some other opening, some specific file formats, figure formats, or writing in different figure formats. So in the end, actually, this Mamba is now installing 72 packages. So there's actually 72 libraries that are needed for this specific environment, for this specific project. And now it's downloading and extracting all the packages. And now the environment is ready. So right now I'm not in that specific environment. So as you see here at the end, I need to activate the, the environment. So I activate it. And in the name of the environment is called my env. So now the prompt has changed. If you have worked with Python and specifically from the terminal, you might be familiar with this, but if you have not, this is something that is worth investing some time 
and learning about the content environments. And now it's like I connected to a new system with a new Python installation and specifically the new Python installation that I asked with all the dependencies. And now here I'm able, let's say that I have to pass this environment to, to Samantha. So I'm able to type this command conda m export and this will show all the files all the 72 packages that were installed and you see that there's quite many of them and now it even has so-called resolved down to the tiny version without even to you know to some specific hash of which version of seaborn am i going here so with the syntax that you see here in the in the learning materials conda m export and this greater than it means dump the content that you see here on a file environment.yaml there's a easter egg here that one can also one can also export from history and this is again important to look at this so let me try running also this command And now the difference from this common is that actually this kind of is able to give me back the original environment that I used. So with Conda M export, I got a fine grain detailed version down to the tiny hashtag hashes of, um, of all the 72 packages with Conda M export from history. Maybe this is useful for the next project that I can start. I hope this was a, you know, motivational enough for people to get <laughs> starting using Conda. But this is, again, I repeat, the most frequently asked question every day. We even have a joke in our support room that that um, how many days have been going on without Conda being mentioned. It's usually it's zero. But if we scale down even more, so now we're trying to look at the dependencies of the code, the dependency of all the libraries, what if we scale even bigger, Samantha? Yes. Should I, I? I can keep the screen share if you just tell me when to scroll, ah. or, okay. or do you want to take over? No, you can keep it. Uh, okay. You can scroll down a little bit. So yeah, so now we have been talking about how to um, record the computational steps, how to record our dependencies of the tools that we are already using in our workflow, but what what if it's still not enough? What if we want everything in uh, one file? What if we want like an entire operating system uh, together with the dependencies, with the code, maybe even with the data? Um, and that's where containers come in. Um, now we also get back to the icebreaker before like this topic of it works on my machine. And these containers are like one of the answers to that. And there's many different like um, tools for uh, building using containers. One of them is Docker. That's where this, um, this meme here comes from. And if you scroll a little bit down, we can again think back to our kitchen analogy um, that we have our codes and scripts, which are basically our cooking re re recipes. They tell us what goes um, into our dish and how to prepare it. And then um, we talk uh, in the world of containers, we talk about container definition files, or in the Docker case, it would be called a Docker file. And they are like a blueprint, how to build a kitchen with everything in it, um, that you have everything ready to um, prepare the dish that is described in the, or uh, that you have in your cooking recipe. Um, so the container definition file is the blueprint. It shows us how to, or like how to create this kind of kitchen. And then um, container images are then example kitchens that are built from this blueprint. Um, and now you scrolled away from there, sorry. <laughs> and uh, then we have the containers themselves, uh, which are built from the images, from the example kitchens. Um, 
that are like then really the kitchens where you can prepare these cooking recipes. And you can go through here these uh, images and have a guess which of the images represents which operating system. Uh, containers can come to you in many different forms and in many different occasions you may have come across them. And that's why we also asked this question in the very bottom of the collaborative document. Um, if, you, if you ever have been in contact with containers and how you came across them, because that can be very different for, for people. And um, please go and answer that question if you have come across containers, because that might also like help others to see like where are then the use cases for these kind of um, systems. And um, so the benefit is that you have really everything in one file, not just the dependencies, but really like you can have a whole different operating system. Like if your your laptop is running on Windows, for example, and you find a tool on the internet where you only can find installation instructions or a prepared um, software for Linux system, for example, that might be one case where then a container can be very helpful to like have this operating system that you need to then install your software inside of there and run it via that. Um, and so these definition files that already mentioned, like what we um, related to the blueprints, they are usually text files. And a little bit further down, we have an example of that. And Enrico will show it also in a little bit. Um, they instruct you how to build this um, environment. What what do you need? What kind of operating system do you use? What kind of software do you want to have installed in, in that environment? And then when you build an image from that um, definition file from this container recipe, that is then basically like a piece of paper where you have the operating system and these base tools installed on it. And then whatever you do then on your command line or on your computer um, within that container, then you um, adding like a layer of transparency. You maybe have seen it when you want to update your house or something like this. You have the blueprint of the house in the bottom and then you add a transparent layer where you draw like all your ideas that you want to um, add to your house, that you want to add a staircase uh, in the middle of your living room, just to try to how how it how it looks, um, and then at some point you are like, oh no, that's not the idea. Okay, I throw that away, and that is also then why the image, the container image, it always stays the same. So these transparency layers, they are then thrown away after you close the connection to that container that you are running, um, and other. Um, use cases for containers are exactly this. Um, if you have your code and that runs in a certain environment and you want to make sure that everyone is using like the same environment, you can um, provide them with an image of this container or you can provide them with this um, definition file, like the instructions on how to how to build that image and how to run that in a container. And here is now the example of the of a definition file. This is now from Singularity. Um, I mentioned already Docker, and then there's also Abtainer and Portman, and probably even more than that. But these are, I think, the most famous ones, maybe. Um, uh, this you may come across also when you're working uh, on clusters, for example. It's very much used there. And um, here you can see that this definition file is a text file similar to what we have seen with Conda. We are defining like the, um, the operating system first. Here we are using a Docker image that is somewhere on the Docker hub, I think it's called, um, of Ubuntu, which is a Linux operating system. Um, so if Enrico would, for example, have a Windows laptop and would want to run an Ubuntu on, the, on that laptop, you could use this file to uh, build a container to, to run Ubuntu in. And then you can provide um, a few more things that you want to 
want to add there. So you can define environment variables. You can install stuff, which is done here in this post section. And then you can also um, add scripts that should be run when the container is um, executed. And is that now maybe where we go into the demo? Maybe, yeah. And maybe we can come back to the pros and cons of containers yeah. when we start wrapping things up. <laughs> so I think that this demo is a funny one. So in this specific container recipe that you see here, um, basically the user wants to run the common, the Linux common cause, which is a funny command that um, it displays some ASCII, ASCII art, ASCII cow that can say whatever you tell the cow to say. However, if I would be working on my own computer, I would have all the rights to install this specific cow say command and I wouldn't need to you know, start containers, installing containers, creating containers. But often when I need to scale because my laptop is old and it doesn't have enough RAM or enough CPUs, I most likely, I'm most likely going to work on some remote machine. It can be one HPC cluster, it can be the Lumi supercomputer, it can be various things. So let's now go to this remote machine where I am right now. I can even Conda deactivate. Okay, um, let's see where I am. I have a subfolder called the pen, uh, sorry, environments, because now this is the stage where we're really recording the whole environment, the whole operating system. So if I try to run the command, which is called cause, hello world. All right, the commands is not installed in this remote machine. I could now open a ticket with the administrator of this remote cluster and ask them, can you please install cause, cause? Of course, maybe I feel a bit silly because it's a silly command. Maybe I don't want to ask the administrators to install this type of thing, but it could also well be that the administrator actually are not supporting installations because they get too many requests. And what the administrator could tell you, you know, create yourself, um, container so that you can run this comma. So given this recipe that I've written here in this uh, dev, So this is the same recipe that you see there. And it's again, another one of those machine readable format, machine readable and also human readable that the human understand that we want to use Ubuntu, get an, it, it's like really that I'm installing a new Linux machine and make sure that I run this type of installation uh, script. So let's build it. So the software that I'm going to use, now all the steps that I'm talking about here, they're listed in this exercise two in the, in the page. So the tool I'm gonna use is called Uptainer. Let's see that I have it. Yes, I have Uptainer 1.2. And so Uptainer is one of those tools that kind of emerged from the Singularity project. Uptainer became more like the branch dedicated to scientific computing, while Singularity um, CE is more supporting enterprises. I left this here because these are something that often is a problematic because Uptainer to create the images and it's to download, you, you really need to imagine that you are downloading a full operating system. So it can require lots of disk space, but I already set this step here. So I can look at the environment variables in my, in my, and I already have set this temporary folder and, and a cache folder. And now I can finally build. So now it's like I'm installing this new computer. So obtainer build, uh, the name of the image that I'm gonna create is this CIF, and then the definition file is cowsay.dev. All right, so now what is happening? It's really like that I'm connecting to a new laptop and I'm installing the operating system. So first it needs to download the image of the operating system. It's now installing everything that is needed for Ubuntu. In this operating system, it's installed, it's really so fast. <laughs> it's installing all the cause and everything else. 
it's making sure that you know the the file system of this computer of this virtual virtual computer is you know has everything that is needed installing some other dependencies and hopefully in the very next few seconds it will say that this is done and i can now basically like connect to this computer it's it's funny that i'm still in the same computer so now it's actually creating this this file so now this cif file becomes like a, a new computer that i can log in into and when I'm inside this new computer, even though it's a virtual computer, it's not a physical computer, I'm able to finally run the cause command. So I remind you that we are where I am when I type cause command not found, but now I can actually enter this computer, this virtual machine, this container, uptainer shell, and the name of the image that I created. And now, I'm inside, you see the prompt change. It says obtainer. Now I'm in a new computer and now I can test the command. Let's see if it works. Yes, and we got our cow that can say whatever we wanna say. So suddenly without any administrator rights, without any special permissions, I was able to install a new program and run it. You can understand how powerful this is if you depend on specific, especially machine learning people need to work with some specific version of libraries, PyTorch, which might depend on specific version of so-called CUDA GPU card drivers. And with this system, you can specifically go down to the to the drivers, down to the libraries for 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 your for your research work. So it's 11.49, we still have good 10 minutes for wrapping up. So Samantha, what about the pros and the cons of containers? Yeah, one nice thing here is now also that like, even if something goes wrong, because it still might, like there is so, so many levels where these things can go wrong. Um, because everything is now in one file, it is very easy to remove rather than if you think about if you install install something on your computer, you might have to go into different places to find all the files that you that were actually involved in the installations you're working on at the moment. Um, then also we are, or many of us are now nowadays working with huge data sets and sometimes these data sets are getting too large to transfer. So containers are also one way of like sending the computer to the data, so to say. So we don't have to download the data, but there's probably some kind of cloud service that is set up where you can then like run your container very close to the data and don't have to worry about this transfer. Um, and then if it's, like if you have a lot of dependencies in your in your work, you can take away some of these challenges to deal with these dependencies because they might be on different levels. It might not just be like within Python that you can solve with Conda, but already like on operating system level, there might be some libraries that you need that you need to install in some certain way to make it work. Um, so this is also one way of like recording on how this can be done. And also then with the image, you can actually provide a working machine, so to say. So it also can solve this works on my machine situation. And then um, Enrico could now send this uh, CIF file that he just created to me and I could probably run it here on my computer and also um, like happily look at the at the cow saying different things, even though I don't have it installed on, on my computer. But then of course, um, with this same thing, you can also like solve your installation problems um, by, by hiding them behind this kind of container solution, which may discourage good software development practices. Of course, we hope it doesn't, but it may like result in that. Um, and it can, of course, then also change that now we don't have this works on my machine problem anymore, but it we have this, okay, it works only in this container. And then if you have a colleague who uh, for some reason cannot install this container software on their laptop or something, um, how do they then deal with this? Um, but it still helps um, with, with this works on my machine problem. 
Um, they can sometimes be difficult to modify. So if you, for example, go on Docker Hub and find some image that does almost what you want to do, but not quite, there's something missing. It can be sometimes difficult to modify those. Um, and there is many different ways on how you can go about this by, for example, just adding another layer on top of that image that already exists if that works for your use case. And then um, this similar as with Conda environments, also container images can become very large. They may take up a lot of space on your laptop. Um, so it's always good with all these tools to, as one of the first things that you find out, find out how to clean up unused images, unused containers, not running containers, things that you don't need anymore, how to clean the cache so that um, you like don't run out of disk space because you need to try 10 different operating systems with your software. And then good little red box. Do you have anything to say about the danger, Enrico? Well, I mean, that, that in general, it's like when you install software, you might only want to make sure that you're using official and trusted images that you you never know what you might be installing if you use a untrusted source for let's say ubuntu operating system so this is as usual you know it's it's good to trust those trusted images and if you are not sure talk with your local local helper or colleague in the same page there are also some other demos that you can try yourself for example, if you install Docker on your machine, here there's a nice demo where you can travel back in time to a specific version of our studio. And here with Anaconda, it, with, with Conda, basically, that you can install a specific version. But maybe it's time to wrap up. So where do we go from here? I checked the notes document. I don't see there are very nice questions, interesting questions, but we will answer them there. I think it's now to important though to understand that now we discover and we uncovered all these um, time scales of uh, the documentation of the project from the tiny changes of the git down to the you know large changes of operating system and libraries that are in a specific version of our open setting system so in general the take-home message for you is that this is important for every project but the second important take-home message here is that you don't need to feel anxious or stressful or stressed about all this uh, you know knowledge and all these 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 tools it might well be that some of the tools that we show here today you don't see an immediate use right now it's more than it becomes you like it becomes starts to become a personal choice that maybe you understand that workflow tools are important and you understand that it, it will be there will be some learning curve some time that you need to spend to get it running but then this will make maybe benefit you in the future if you know that you will be running you know many uh, workflows many pipelines or you will be building pipelines in your future future career but for sure it's important to worry about about dependencies again maybe you're just you know playing with code and you're just happy with one local python installation and after a few months by installing random packages you see that it's all a mess and then you will just reinstall everything and start from scratch but sometimes when it's not about working alone anymore when you need especially to show to other people your work that you've been doing the dependencies so the conda environments and even writing down the steps it, it it becomes kind of part part of your work so at the end of the day it's not just sharing your code to show what you did in your in your research but also sharing kind of how for ad, how other people how other scientists can can rerun your code and then last comment when it comes to the containers again you got a nice overview on the pros and cons you might wonder do i need do i have a use for them it might well be that right now you don't need you know to learn singularity obtainer docker and, and so on but then you start facing the issue that you need to use a remote supercomputer and suddenly you can't install the tools that you need or more in general 
you did such such an important work that you really need to document it that this work these results should really need to be reproduced in 10 years from the future so again with the higher requirements of your project then you might start thinking you know maybe i really need to use containers for this for this case hopefully the overview that we gave is kind of useful for everyone from the most beginner to the most advanced users is there anything else to cover samantha anything to mention from the collaborative notes no there's very many questions and it's really really great thank you and we will still go through these and answer a bit more and also please ask follow-up questions if the explanation you got there is not sufficient or doesn't solve your question yeah i mean thank you for listening everyone as usual we wrote in the collaborative notes this feedback part because we are continuously improving our our lessons workshop after workshop and so if there's something that could you know have more clarity or they would require more justifications just you know just write it there all or comments all feedback are welcome so yes, and samantha will you now go and start using singularity after this <laughs> <laughs> i did start actually using after a code refinery workshop many years ago okay um and i hope well, yeah, that everyone got a got an impression what they what these tools can be useful for. And as mentioned before, like the easiest way to get into it is start using them and then ask from your local IT support um, if you run into issues with them. And I think now we have a one hour break before we go into the next lesson, which if I remember correctly, is social coding for the afternoon. Is that correct? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Samantha, for being here with me again. It was nice to teach together. It's Thank 12 o'clock in Finland, 11 o'clock in Central Europe. So it's time for a lunch or brunch, depending on the taste. See you in one hour. And thank you. Bye. Bye.